Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. First off, let me ask you this. Are you all really prepared for the future? Think. Over a period of time, we have seen the regular jobs becoming redundant. So today, you need to be prepared for the unseen. And this requires a lot of learning and unlearning and probably thinking out of the box. Keeping this in view, we have planned a series of skill building sessions to help you be prepared for what can be a big game tomorrow. As a part of these series, we bring to you the best of faculties from renowned universities to get hands-on knowledge about skills needed for a successful, so successful future. And this is brought to you by SourceScholarship.com, a platform where you can avail the best scholarship offers from 500 top global universities. We help you make an informed career choice through a psychometric test and discovery of some unheard niche undergrad courses. So do register and avail the amazing scholarship offers from the global universities. Moving on for today's session on building skills for a successful career in art by Associate Professor Shane Halbert from RMIT and Manisha Akrawal, again from RMIT University. A bit about RMIT University. RMIT University is a top ranked global university in design, technology, and enterprise. Located in the heart of Melbourne and also has two campuses in Vietnam and a hub in Barcelona, Spain. The speaker, Professor Shane Halbert, is a Melbourne based academic, artist, and curator. He is the Associate Dean Photography in the School of Art at RMIT University. His photographic work has been showcased nationally and internationally. We also have Ms. Manisha Agarwal, who has been working with RMIT University's South Asia Hub in India for the past five years. She currently heads the admission operations and school engagement activities for South Asia region. Welcome, Shane. Welcome, Manisha. And over to you both. Thanks very much. Thank you, and, and uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Ravi, and welcome everyone, and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you all this afternoon. I am uh, just going to share my screen. I'm going to talk about uh, this idea of what a creative future might look like. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to introduce some of the ideas around the future of employment going to introduce some of the ways that we might think about our employment futures and, and the way that our choices in education uh, are, are going to inform that future. And then uh, we're going to look at my university in particular and the art school and the kinds of things that you can study here with us. Uh, and then Manusha is going to talk to you about uh, ways in which you might be able to, to access what we do here. Um, I have, we have a bit of a custom in Australia around our, our heritage and our history. Uh, and I am speaking to you from uh, the beautiful um, uh, Dandenong Ranges to the east of Melbourne. And this, uh, this area ha has been looked after by the indigenous peoples of Australia for, for thousands and thousands of years. And, and they've done that through land management and also the development of culture uh, and an extraordinary artistic practice that has uh, really informed the way that uh, we at RMIT think about uh, our relationship to land. And so I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge that history and the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands I am talking to you from today. So RMIT University, uh, is a university of technology and design. It's, a, it's an extraordinary university that occupies a large portion of Melbourne's CBD, indeed uh, around sort of 10% of the, of the footprint, 75,000 plus students. Uh, and as you can see here, a, a very highly ranked uh, university in terms of art and design, number 15 in the world, uh, which of course means we are number one in Australia. So very well positioned to talk to you about art and design education and, and, in, and very, indeed very well positioned um, for you to consider coming and studying with us. I thought I might start though with a little bit of a story about the history of the university, because it's really important that we understand not only um, you know, the, the, the sort of the legacy and the impact that universities can make in our lives, but also in terms of what they can contribute to a culture of a city. So it's 
for us, it's quite an old university. It's 134 years old, started in 1887. But what's really interesting is that before they even opened the doors to what was then called the Working Men's College, the university or the, the college polled the local Melbourne community and asked them, what are the kinds of things that you think are important to learn? What are the kinds of skills and the sorts of knowledge that will be needed to support Melbourne as it transitions into a new century? You know, thinking of the Industrial Revolution and manufacturing and the kinds of extraordinary development that only, the, you know, that we see within that sort of short period of time leading up to, you know, the 50 years before 1887. So they asked the community, you know, what are the sorts of things that you want to learn? And of course, not only was it about that particular time, but it was about what are the sorts of things that will help transition Melbourne as a city in Australia, as a country, into a new century. And art and photography were indeed two foundation courses. The community thought that learning about photography and learning about art would be critical for that transition into a new century. What that means is that photography at RMIT is really old. In fact, it is amongst the oldest ongoing, RMIT is amongst the oldest ongoing universities to teach photography anywhere in the world. So it's an extraordinary, um, it's an extraordinary campus and we have a, a, an incredible legacy and history of teaching photography and of teaching art. So the reason I'm telling you that story is that we're sort of at a similar point now. I know we're sort of 21 years into a new century, but the way that the workforce is changing, the way that, the way that we're living, uh, the way that we're engaging globally uh, with, with communities from around the world and, the, and what that means for employment means that we have quite significant challenges ahead of us. And creativity is really a central pillar of the university. And it really, it really, as you will see from my presentation here today, hopefully it will help you understand how much creativity informs our own future and certainly your future. I thought I might also highlight a, a, a somewhat opposing view to this concept of, of what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, maths. Certainly understand the need to identify a, a focus through certain subjects and to group these into, well, you know, an easy acronym. But I also want to look at this from a slightly more holistic way. We need to remind ourselves that many students finishing secondary school, so yourselves, uh, will be working in jobs that, you know, we, we know this, they don't exist or they're going to change a lot, but the future is slightly uncertain and certainly more uncertain for this generation than it has been in the past. And, and, you know, working in jobs that have been significantly transformed from where they are now. So I thought I might pose three simple words as a way of thinking about this. Uh, creativity, collaboration and critical thinking. And so a, a common opposition to STEM is this idea of STEAM, which also includes the arts and by extension, creative inquiry and reflection the why of something rather than the how do we do it. And it is this creativity that I intend to sort of focus on today. What does it mean to be creative? Uh, and what does it mean to have a career in a creative discipline? And of course, you know, equally and really important is what is the role of creativity, collaboration and critical thinking in our future? We, uh, certainly in my schooling and, and to some extent, even my eight year old child's schooling at the moment, sort of quite focused on the three R's from the Industrial Revolution, reading, writing and arithmetic. But now more than ever, we need to sort of shift our thinking and include what we're referring to as these three um, C's. And I will talk, I'll, I'll talk more about this as we go along. So I thought what I, I would start with is by posing a relatively simple question. And really, uh, the, the question is around what are the conditions that are driving the future of employment? Now, I, I like this because it's you know slightly humorous and a bit playful, um, but will a robot take my job? Indeed, that is a very important question. Uh, it's a real question, it's a real issue. Um, the reason that we ask it is, you know, it's sort of think a next level down is what is the level of automation that's likely to exist within my industry and how indeed will this impact on my employment future? Well. The good news is that we 
have some answers. Uh, there is indeed a website, uh, ironically called, Will Robots Take My Job? And, and they have done quite extensive research on this very question. It looks like a fun website. Indeed, it's, it's you know, very colourful and, and, and easy to work through. Um, but there is, but it's real, and, and the logic behind the site is scholarly robust. Uh, it's based on a lot of research, uh, and it's, uh, but it is fundamentally anchored to that one question. So I thought for today we could test it, and I thought we would start with the simplest of of, um, of professions, and indeed the one that is really popular. Uh, it's popular amongst parents. <laughs> it's popular amongst um, students, you know, and, and um, school leavers looking for solid, um, stable careers. You know, so it's, it seems like it's a good one to try first. So will algorithms, will robots take the job of an accountant and, uh, and finance officer? What does the algorithm say? It says you are pretty much doomed, yes. 94% uh, probability that automation will uh, fundamentally take over this employment industry in the not too distant future. Um, there's quite a good projected growth into the middle of the decade. There's a lot of people employed. These are American numbers, mind you, 1.2 million people. That's a lot of people. Uh, and the median wage is sort of you know, very healthy, uh, 71,000. That's quite a lot of money. Um, so it still sounds like it's a career that's on the rise, but um, this website tells us that it's problematic and that the risk for automation or automation is quite high. What about if we plug in different careers, artists, photographer, creative practitioners, designers? What, what kind of response do we get then? Well, we get the complete opposite, a 1.5%, meaning it is completely safe, totally safe. 1.5% probability of automation. Reasonable projected growth, certainly not as strong as accounting and finance, far, far fewer people employed, just under 30,000, but a slightly higher median annual wage. But that, that number of people employed is on the rise, uh, as is the, the median wage. So it's worth noting that, um, you know, we're talking about uh, a sort of a career and employment trajectory that's rising versus one that is, is, is you know, is problematic, potentially quite problematic. So the question is, you know, will robots take my job? But what's the, what sits underneath that? What are the fundamental um, parameters that we're referring to? And really, what is it that we're talking about? Well, it's quite straightforward. Um, how do we find answers to problems is the real question. And that is ultimately what more and more of our working life involves. What they're saying is pretty simple. If the solution to a problem exists, then artificial intelligence is going to find it. I must say, I'm not a particularly big fan of the term artificial intelligence. I think it's quite sexy and, and, and sits within a, a way of, of, of sort of advertising, marketing and promoting new forms of technology. But what they're really talking about is machine learning, where, where machines are able to, to run parameters and learn from the responses and the results that they get from those parameters and develop new parameters. So. It's a powerful computing platform made even more powerful by virtue of the kinds of technology that we are, we are developing uh, throughout the world. So if the solution to a problem exists, then algorithms, robots, they will indeed find it. And I think, I think back to, to when I go to the accountant, you know, um, and I want to do my tax return, get some money back from the government. We all love getting money back from the government. Uh, I, I put in my tax return, I put in all of the information, the accountant looks up a few things, he says, oh yes, that's this, this account, this ruling, and that's this one, let's apply that to your tax return, da 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 da, -da and we get a result back. The critical thing there is that the answers already exist. And so if that's what an accountant's role is, then you know, increasingly we will start to see software developers and big software companies start to apply more and more of that machine learning, more and more of that knowledge built into their software so that people can do their own tax returns and, and corporations can run their own accounts more and more um, accurately through, through these systems. But the opposite end of that is that if the solution to a problem does not exist, then it needs to be created. If the solution is not repetitive, if 
if it's if it's not known, you know, and in terms of repetitive, we need only look at the automotive industry 10 years ago, even 20 years ago, factories, manufacturing. These are all being um, you know, vastly taken over by by some of these things. But if the solution to a problem does not exist, then it needs to be created. You don't have the answer, you need to find one. And that's where creative um, practitioners, where creative skills certainly come into it. So what are these creative skills that I'm talking about? Um, well, they are well now and increasingly they are the, the critical skills for the careers of the future. And they're aligned with some of those complementary concepts that I spoke about before, um, the, the, the sort of the three C's. And here is what um, here is what we teach in an art school. This is what art schools predominantly in one sentence, if you can capture it in one sentence, this is what this is partly what we're about. Um, transforming ideas and reflections into new images or objects or or, or whatever the outcome is. And, and sort of thinking about, or, or ways of thinking about the world in which we live. We can think of it as, uh, as what a sort of an Australian academic, Paul Carter referred to as material thinking. What is, what is the material of thought? If I have an idea, how do I materialize that? How do I convert and transform that idea into something that, other, that I can share with other people that can help inform the way they think about their lives or provide enjoyment or help them to solve uh, or go some way towards helping them solve a problem that they didn't understand. These are the sorts of things that that we uh, seek to to support our students in learning. Uh, when I talk about problems, you know, I'm, I'm talking about some of the what we refer to as the wicked problems of the world, and they are fundamentally being solved creatively. I mean things like climate change. Um, driverless cars to, to sort of reinvent and innovate the way people move around cities. Uh, we talk about healthcare. Creative care is a really important part of health and, and the way that people um, the way that people are able to, to, to respond to their health conditions. Food securities. These are all, you know, education. These are all problems that uh, we don't have solutions for. And these are all problems that are increasingly being uh, driving the future of humanity and increasingly being um, tackled through creative, um, creative critical thinking. We should also uh, note at this point that creative industry graduates often develop what we refer to as transferable skills. Uh, these are often results, or this often results in the idea of what we like to call the embedded creative. Uh, someone who's working outside of the cultural sector uh, but is using their innovation, their inquiry, uh, their skills in transforming abstract ideas into solutions as a valued skill set that's being applied in other sectors and in other industries. Thinking about, um, you know, some of those big global accounting firms, Deloitte's, um, PricewaterhouseCooper, an Australian one, um, you know, they're employing a range of people now, not just accountants. And, and, and some of the people that they are employing have backgrounds in creative practice, in critical thinking, and in collaborate, collaborative problem solving. Now, I want to just share some sort of dry, a little bit dry information here, but it's worth just taking a look. Um, I haven't randomly selected a number of, uh, of sectors, but I'll talk about that in a moment. But what we're looking at is, uh, is a survey response from the Australian government about where graduates go once they complete their study. It's really important information. Knowing, knowing where, what people are doing with their undergraduate degrees uh, is critical for supporting uh, and, and looking at the holistic you know, nature of education in the community in the country. So it's really critical that we have this understanding. And what we're looking at here is full-time employment. You know, these are, this is in response to uh, full-time full employment. And so you can look and you can see, you know, there's quite a lot of, of different options in here, but I included ones that are aligned with art and design, certainly in terms of computing and information systems, um, health services and support, environmental studies, building and construction, architecture, medical science. These are the sorts of areas where Increasingly, we're starting to see those embedded creative practices uh, emerging, supporting and collaborating with 
these sectors. So I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at some of those. Um, so we can see a relatively even spread. I mean, of close to 80% is, is incredible. 80, that means sort of 70, you know, sort of 79, 80, 78 to 82 percent of graduates in you know creative arts are being employed full time. It's 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 high, um, but again, it's worth noting that this is in overall full time employment. And the reason that that is important, the reason I'm sort of noting that, is because you know it's all employment types. So it's full time, part time, self employed. <laughs> These are people that you know are working or, or where creative practices form part of their employment portfolio that could include a couple of jobs. Maybe on Monday and Tuesday they're they're working for an ad agency. Um, maybe Wednesday, Thursday they might be running their own design firm and and working with clients. Um, Friday they might work in an institution. It just depends on on what they're doing. And you know it's this this is sort of part of of our employment futures, the or the rather contentious, this idea of the gig economy. So these are all employment types, not just full time, just to clarify that, all employment types. When we go down and look at only full time employment, this is graduates who in Australia have logged on to a website that we call seek.com, one of many, uh, and typed in pharmacy or pharmacist or project manager or whatever it is to find a job or uh, throughout their throughout their undergraduate study they've managed to secure full-time employment at the end of their uh, study so this is people that are only employed full-time it does tell a pretty different story though um, when you have a look at that the creative arts well, it doesn't look so good um, <laughs> you know you might be thinking oh why, why are we why are we looking at this that's awful um, but what it does tell us though uh, is that in that sort of creative arts area, a majority of our students are finding work through entrepreneurial enterprise formation. They're designing their own. Uh, they're designing their own work life. They're um, they're working independently across the board, rather than being attached to particular sort of traditional jobs. And you know, I mean, this is this is what we would this is what we would expect. It's been that way for quite some time. Um, it's worth noting, though, that it, it was sort of starting to drop and then rise again until last year. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure we have to wait and see how 2020 recovers. We don't, um, you know, I'd love to have a website for that, but we don't. So if we have a look at this on a slightly more micro level, macro level, um, we're just looking at photography now, uh, given that this is my area. Uh, and we can see in Australia quite an interesting uh, and certainly some interesting data and certainly supports what I was saying before. Employment growth is quite good, 13.5%. That's quite strong. Salary growth is definitely there, but overwhelmingly self-employed. If we look at the yellow area, uh, self-employment is, is predominantly the way that people are engaging in this sector. And again, it's the same in, in the other fields. The way that you might think about this is, you know, if you're looking for that real security, if you're looking for that, I just want to open the paper, log onto a website, find a job, then um, I, I would suggest that maybe this is probably not for you. But if you are looking for that sort of expanded opportunity, um, I, you know, I can sort of, you can forge your own pathway in employment and design your portfolio of what a career looks like for you, then the creative sector is really enticing because that is predominantly how people work in that space. All right, let's now have a look at uh, how you might do this. How, what can RMIT do for you if what I've said so far resonates and if this is what you are interested in, then how can RMIT support you in your study options and how can RMIT help you to become the kind of creative practitioner uh, that you want to be? Um, just reiterating, you know, I, 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 any opportunity to say this, when we do say RMIT is the number one art school, art design university in the country, we're not making it up. We have the data to support it. So ranked 15th in the world and number one in Australia is an extraordinary, extraordinary accomplishment. 
uh, I'm just going to very quickly flip through to another, another page, which is our uh, 2020 graduate exhibition. And the reason I'm doing this is because I wanted to highlight uh, the diverse nature of what our art school can offer. Um, and in particular, the mixture of practices that you can see here in, uh, in craft, uh, through ceramics and gold and silver smithing, uh, also into uh, sort of contemporary fine art, as well as photography. All of our programs uh, are generative in that you can start with an undergraduate, you can move into an honours, and then you can move into uh, a master's by coursework program or into a research degree. So if we sort of scroll through here, you can see, and you can see the URL up the top here, so you'll be able to, to link into that yourself. But you can see that diverse nature of practices that lives within the school and the kinds of things that our students are able to do. And what that does is it supports this, na this nature of independent self-directed exploration. Students come up with their inquiry, they work out what they wanna do, and then they use the material, they use the, they use the area that they're focusing on to be able to support and learn ways in which they are able to do that. This gives us an indication of what our sorts of what, what a creative output looks like, certainly in a visual um, or in a sort of contemporary art school. All right, back to my presentation. Um, so we, uh, as school leavers, we've got two programs that we are promoting and, and certainly that would be of, of benefit for, for students looking to begin a career in the arts. Um, and so I've got here two of those programs, Fine Art, Bachelor of Arts Fine Art and our Bachelor of Arts Photography program. They're both three years, they're both full-time for international students. The Fine Art one, as you would imagine, specializes in fine art with an aligned study in making and the critical analysis of art. We offer a range of particular studio specializations, ceramics, drawing, gold and silver smithing, painting, print, uh, sculpture and video. And align with that are studies in sound art, uh, animate, experimental animation, um, sort of public art projects, whatever you can envisage, we can, you know, ideally we'd be able to support you in doing that. The Bachelor of Arts Photography program, also three years, uh, specialising in photography, everything is photography, um, but again, aligned study in, in making uh, and that critical analysis of photographic histories and cultures. Both programs are uh, fundamentally um, studio driven in terms of you learn by making. The photography program is conceptually collaborative. Photography by its very nature is conceptually collaborative, certainly working with uh, fashion, working with journalism, activism, uh, uh, architecture, any range of, of, of other, of, of an art, of course, uh, any range of, uh, of other sectors and other industries that help to inform the nature of a photographic practice. The, the next big question, of course, then is, well, if I like it, <laughs> how, do I, how do I apply? How do I get in? Manusha will talk a little bit more about um, applying as an international student. Uh, but in terms of what you do for us, it's really important. And if you're watching and listening to this, then it's a good opportunity to get some tips and tricks, uh, some inside information. But what we require is essentially uh, creative works. We want to see what you are able to make. Uh, we want to see what your photography is like. We want you to send us a, a folio of creative works. So if you're thinking about the kinds of things you might want to study in your final years of secondary education, then the kinds of courses would be those that, or subjects would be those that support you making work. Uh, we do sort of take study scores principally in English language but we don't have an actual university score that we use to determine entry. It is principally on that folio. We also uh, like our, our applicants to be able to 
unpack ideas and concepts, certainly the ideas and concepts in society that would help you to discuss the works that you have put in your folio. Thinking uh, sort of generally here, uh, it's very easy to use art and photography as an observational practice. That is to say that you can walk or you can take a camera and you know, frame the world that you see and rely on the interest of the event unfolding or the, the situation or the, or the site that you are photographing to, to provide that, um, you know, that sort of aesthetic piece. Or likewise with drawing and painting, again, it's, it's, you know, it's one thing to observationally draw, it's another thing to express an idea. We are more interested in your ideas. We like that you can, that you have skill in craft and making, but these need to be discussed and connected to the development of an idea. We also like for our, our applicants to be able to demonstrate that they are aware of communities of practice and influence. So what does a typical applicant or a typical application look like? Well, it would include creative work. Um, and when I say creative work, what I really mean is what's the best work that you have? What are the examples? What are your best examples of what you can present to us? We often get, we often get all sorts of strange things you can imagine, right? We get people interpreting that in strange ways. Quite often we ask, you know, we, in photography, we might ask for nine images. Someone will send us three landscapes, three portraits and three still lives as if that means something. They might send us three colour photographs, three black and white photographs and three digital photographs as though that means something. It doesn't really. What we just want to see is your best work. And quite often we would see something like that and we would sort of go, oh, why are they sending us black and white photographs when they've got all this really interesting landscape work? I'd much prefer to see more of that. So when you're thinking about your folio, it really is what are the best images that I can send through? What's the best example of my work? Then we ask you to write a statement and uh, we would also, uh, if you are shortlisted, we would also invite you to an interview. And in that statement and at that interview, we principally want to talk to you about your ideas. Where do they come from? What is it that you are exploring in your work? So rather than framing the world, you're actually seeking something out that helps to demonstrate or not illustrate, but helps us to understand the concept that you are exploring, whether it's climate change, uh, whether it is um, certain types of portraiture, whether it is fashion, photography, whatever it ends up being, we want to see what your ideas are. And then we want you to be able to link that to other examples of what's happening in the world. We often get uh, applicants who say, well, you know, I like Van Gogh and Cezanne and Picasso. And we look at that and think, well, that's just what you studied in high school. That's just what you studied in secondary school. We want to know what you can find independently and we want to know what, what you find and how that connects to the kind of work that you are making. So just to summarise this, because it's really important, we want creative works. That's how we see uh, how, that's how we gauge the competitiveness of our applicants. And that's also how we gauge the suitability of our applicants for the programs. We want you to be able to understand and discuss your ideas and concepts, and we want you to be able to link those into the global community of, of photography and art and creative practice and explain why you like the work that you like. I can give you some examples. I think maybe we'll we'll move on to the to the example a bit. So in Melbourne, in uh, lockdown, we ran a, a an online fashion photography studio. The lockdown was pretty extensive. Um, there was no campus access. Uh, in, indeed, for several months, people weren't weren't really allowed to leave their home other than shopping, exercise, um, uh, care for other people, or or, or um, go to the doctor certainly couldn't leave their home to go and photograph, unfortunately. So several of our students banded together from this fashion photography studio and created their own virtual fashion studio with a, a, an interactive, what's known as WebXR space. So 
virtual, virtual environments on a screen. Uh, they collaborated, put it all together, and then each of them were able to show their work in that space. Probably one of the more innovative examples is what we're seeing here from Wei Shan Shou, one of our Chinese students. Uh, indeed, this, his, his work was really quite successful, so successful, in fact, that it caught the attention of an agency, an ad agency, uh, and now he's working in, I believe, Hong Kong, uh, doing similar kinds of virtual WebXR spaces uh, and creating those spaces. And you can see here uh, an example of that um, and a sort of a, and a, and a close-up example of, of that. So what we're, uh, what we're really, I guess, looking for are students who, or applicants who want to work innovatively, who want to be able to uh, apply their skills and, and their creative um, understandings and innovations throughout a range of different uh, spaces. Some of you may end up working as photographers and as artists. Some of you might transfer those into other sectors, aligned sectors like advertising or the commissioning of public works, film and television, museums, galleries, curating. You might go further afield and work in education. You might work for, for business organisations to try and support their out-of-the-box thinking and ways of tackling some of the problems that they have through um, working as um, a facilitator or, or something else, uh, or you may work in research. So the, there, there are many options. Um, you need to be as creative in finding those options as you are in the uh, in the work, in the making of the work itself, um, but really, um, what you know, what we're sort of pitching is, and hopefully, we've been able to frame quite a positive picture of RMIT and of our art school, and how we're working towards providing that meaningful toolkit uh, for your future employment. Certainly, with creative practice at at the core of that. I might now hand over to Manusha, who's going to talk about being an international student at RMIT University. Manusha, I might pass over to you now if you're still here, please. But thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Hopefully that was uh, helpful for you. Thanks, Manusha. Thank, thank you very much, Shane. Um, just to let the audience know, uh, Shane is actually an alumnus of RMIT, having completed his bachelor's and master's of arts in media arts, and also his PhD at the university. And he's been an academic at the university since 2000. He's been a program director for both Bachelor of Art Photography and um, uh, Bachelor of Arts Fine Arts. Uh, he's currently, of course, the Associate Dean of Photography, and he chairs the school's education committee as well. Um, he's not just an academic, but an artist and a curator. So just the perfect person to give you an idea of what skills are required uh, for a successful career in art and photography. Um, and, and if you study at RMIT, what, what you can gain um, by coming to uh, coming and studying with us. So um, as Shane mentioned, I will briefly go through um, information about RMIT University and also um, give you a brief about how the application process would be in case you're interested in starting an application at the university. Um, so just let me share my screen, please. I hope the screen's visible to everyone. Okay. So um, I think Ravi already introduced me earlier. Um, I am the country head for operations and school engagement in the South Asia hub of RMIT University based in New Delhi in India. Uh, a very brief introduction to the university. Um, as Shane mentioned, it was founded in 1887 as a working men's college and is now a public university, one of the largest universities in Australia. It is ranked in the top 1% of the universities globally. And of course, we are ranked very highly in the field of art and design. We have more than 450 qualifications that the students can choose to study with us. We have around 97,000 students from across 230 countries across the world. Um, we uh, have more than 450,000 alumni, again, uh, across the world. 
some pictures of our beautiful campuses in and around Melbourne CBD. The city campus is right in the heart of CBD area. Um, in fact, RMIT owns about 7% of all buildings in the city centre. Uh, and that's a big advantage for students, um, you know, if they want public access to public transport, they're looking for accommodation close to the university, they're looking for, um, you know, restaurants or departmental stores, or, you know, everything is easily accessible in the city campus. Uh, Brunswick and Bandura campus uh, are about 30 minutes out of the CBD area. At Brunswick, we teach our uh, fashion and other design programs. And at Bandura, we teach a number of our health science and a few engineering programs. I would encourage the audience to Google search RMIT videos. We have a video for almost every study area. You can get 360 degree views of the university. You can do a campus tour of the university. So I, and there are thousands of videos which are available, uh, which will give you a glimpse of what the university looks like, what the program looks like, who are the teachers teaching the programs. So I encourage you to have a look and um, maybe watch some of those videos, uh, depending on what you're interested in studying further. Um, I think Shane covered a bit of uh, uh, the programs that we offer at the School of Art. There are two main areas, fine arts and photography, that are taught at the School of Art. And there are a number of short and single courses available in case students want to get a feel of what uh, teaching at RMIT is like. So they can choose from these as well. In terms of the application process, um, there are four basic steps to be followed. Step one is to identify the program that you would like to study. So um, read up about the program, the accreditation information, there is information on career outcomes, what you will be studying, etc. Check the fees, check the entry requirements, also check the, um, the intake dates. Step two, you can look at the entry requirements a bit more in detail. So there is an admissions criteria which is specified on each program page. Uh, if you select your country as India, if you're applying from India, uh, it will give you the qualification that you might be doing. So it will say CBSE, ICSE, IB, IG, ICGSE, all, all the qualifications would be listed. You can select that and you can see what are the uh, score requirements from your uh, school. And then it will have additional requirements, which is where portfolio and other requirements would be mentioned in detail. There would also be English language requirements. So you need to make sure that you have, you meet all those requirements before you start the application process. You need to collect the required documents. So if you're finishing year 12, we would like to see your year 12 certificate, English language proficiency certificate. We would also like to see your portfolio. So just collect all the documents and get them certified. The fourth step uh, is to submit your application. So we use a platform called StudyLink. Uh, it's an online application system um, and students are encouraged to submit all the documents once they have them on StudyLink. So as I mentioned, the academic transcripts, English test scores, I'll come to SSVF statement of purpose. In case students have done diplomas or um, other studies which are relevant to the program that they're applying for, they may wish to apply for a credit exemption. So in that case, a course syllabus would be required portfolio. I think Shane's explained the portfolio very well. So a portfolio of your artwork. And as an international student, your passport copy as well. The SSVF statement of purpose is basically an RMIT statement of purpose, which will check your visa eligibility. Um, and we will ask questions that might influence your visa outcome. So we usually ask that for students from certain areas in India. Um, and we would, once you submit the application, in case you haven't submitted the statement of purpose, we will come back and ask for this document later. For students from South Asia, RMIT is offering the Future Leaders Scholarship. This scholarship um, offers a 20% tuition fees reduction in the annual tuition fees, and it applies to every year of study that the student would do with us. So this, uh, this scholarship would apply to our fine arts and photography programs as well. Um, there is no separate application. When you lodge an application, 
we will consider it for the scholarship. And if you are found eligible, then we will be able to give you an offer with the scholarship included. What are the next steps after you've got an offer letter? Um, you need, once, once the borders open and the students are able to travel again to Australia, um, you would need to apply for your visa. You would need to book a flight, organize accommodation. RMIT offers a free pickup from the airport, but you need to give us six to seven days advance notice of your flights, and then we can arrange and confirm the pickup. You need to look at what needs to be packed, what is allowed and what is not allowed in the country when you're, when you're arriving, um, and also learn a little bit about the Australian laws and customs. In terms of accommodation, we have a range of, of sorry, a range of options for the international students. We have purpose-built student accommodations, which are fully furnished within walking distance with a swipe card access, so absolutely safe and secure um, accommodation facilities. We have share houses and we have short-term hostel accommodations available as well. All these accommodation options are listed on our website. Once the students have got their offer letters, we encourage them to go visit the website, look at the various options, and then depending on their personal needs and their budgets, they can choose the accommodation facility. If they go for short-term accommodation, they can arrive in Melbourne and then take assistance from our accommodation support service to find more long-term accommodation as well. Um, outside of the classroom, uh, there is a lot of things that the students can do. We have over 160 different clubs and societies for students to join. We have about 40 sports clubs. We have cultural clubs, creative clubs, social and academic clubs. Um, we have a number of different schemes like Mates at RMIT, uh, which organize trips and tours. Um, there is a big Indian student club as well, which is a part of the um, RMIT Student Union. And they organize a lot of cultural activities uh, from time to time. Every festival, Independence Day, Republic Day, there, there are festivities that um, are celebrated across the university. So this brings me to the end of uh, very brief information about the university. We would love to connect with you if you would like to apply to RMIT. And as I mentioned, we are in India. So do connect with us on south.asia at rmit.edu.au. Um, and and uh, we'd be happy to help you out with the application process or even more detailed information about the programs. Thank you very much for listening in today. And um, 